Hello, good, uh, good morning and uh, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to those ones who are in church this morning and also those ones who are watching us online or virtually wherever you are. I want to take this opportunity to once again welcome you to our service this morning. My name is Elder Tom Mumura, an elder in this church. And uh, it's always a privilege for me to get an opportunity to stand before the children of God in his church to preach and share the word of the Lord. It is a privilege, and at the same time it's a challenge, because this is a holy place where I'm standing and I know that I am in an imperfect person. And therefore, friends, those ones watching us virtually and those ones in church, do pray for me as I share the word of the Lord this morning. Today is a strategic planning day, a support for our department that is uh, implementing the strategic plan. And this team is implementing our five-year strategic plan that has been running since 2020 and coming to an end in 2024, sometime next year. I do not know how many of you know about the plan, but in the course of today, in the afternoon, the team is going to make a presentation to all church members so that they can bring every one of us up to speed as we are all collectively contribute towards the implementation of the strategic plan. Friends, the concept of planning is clearly expressed or implied in the Bible. The verses in the Bible highlight the importance of planning ahead of time so that we can avoid any pitfalls that uh, may have disastrous consequences on the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what's more important for us and to know and to remember that God wants us to succeed in his work and therefore, we should not worry. All we need to do is look up to Jesus Christ. And indeed, that which we have planned will be successful. As you may be aware or know, that in the church context, when we are talking about planning, it's really in the context of driving the Great Commission. The Great Commission is in Matthew 28, from verse 18 to 20. And indeed, this becomes a kind of a blueprint for us in our evangelistic work that we are doing in our church and world over. It's important that I, we go through this, and I want us to uh, go to Matthew chapter 28, just to get to understand what this calling, this great commission is all about. So, going to Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, I want to read. It reads that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. These are words attributed to our Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And verse 20 says, And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. My friends, my sermon this morning is entitled... Are you worthy of the calling? Are you worthy of the calling? And the calling we are talking about here 
is the calling to this great commission. Let us pray. Our dear Father and our God who is in heaven, we want to come before thee once again this Holy Sabbath day to thank you and to praise you, O Lord. May you receive glory and honor. Father, now that we are going to go into your word, we pray that, Lord, may you re-energize me, may you use me, O King of glory, and we pray that, Lord, you prepare our congregants that they may receive this word. May you receive glory and honor. And if it be your will, Lord, that we may also receive a blessing. Amen. Amen. Friends, yeah, the Great Commission is, is a big one. It's big and it's heavy. The scope is huge. And going by what it's really tasking us to do, you can make how big it is. Talking about making disciples of all nations and baptizing them, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It's no easy task. It's not something that we can do on our own effort. We need Jesus. We need Jesus Christ. And friends, this great commission that we have been called to can be an easy task if we involve Jesus Christ in everything. It's only Jesus, and Jesus took responsibility for its success. And uh, he took responsibility by saying, And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. That is a promise. And we just need to claim that very promise. And indeed, Jesus will see us through. Ellen G. White, in the book From Heaven with Love, page 548, talks about the Great Commission. And I just want to quote what Ellen G. White has said in your hearing. Page 548, paragraph 2 reads, The Savior's Commission includes all believers to the end of time. It is fatal to suppose that the work of saving souls depends on the ordained minister alone. For this work, the church was established. For this work, the church was established. And all who take its vows are blessed to be co-workers with Christ. So whatever one's calling is in life, his first interest or our first interest should be to win souls for Christ. Yes, you and me may not be able to speak to congregations but we can provide support. We can work for individuals. So this calling is for every one of us. And nobody can say that this is not for me. No. It's for you and me and everyone else who has accepted Jesus Christ. And did you know that once you take those vows, Jesus Christ just hires you to his work immediately? you get hired. And therefore, we are all hired to be able to serve. I want just to reiterate um, on this, what Aaron Dewitt I said, and just present four observations. One, that the Great Commission is for all of us, believers, to the end of time. Not just now, but to the end of time. And the, and the spirit of prophecy is very clear on this. It says, whatever one's calling in life, his first interest should be to win souls for Christ. He may not be able to speak to congregations, but he can work for individuals. In other words, you and me can work for individuals. And let's not say that we are not gifted, because the Bible says each and every one of us has been gifted, that no one can actually claim they cannot do anything to respond to the call. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 12, it's very, very clear. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. Different good gifts, same Spirit that distributes them. Therefore, we cannot all be equally gifted. You get that point? We cannot be equally gifted. So there are those who can do this, there are those ones who can do the other. Okay? But collectively, we are all working towards this course, towards this calling. Ellen G. White further 
in the same book, From Heaven with Love, same page 548, verse, paragraphs 3 and 4, she writes that everyone is to begin where he is. In our own families, maybe souls are starving for the bread of life. They are hidden at our very doors. You don't have to look far. You don't have to go out there. We are being told, start right here. Start at home. Okay? And then go out. Because there are people who are starving. Okay? For lack of bread of life. In your very, very home. In your very, very next door. And therefore, it is a place for us to start. And since we, are, we know that the gifts of the Spirit are promised to every believer according to their need for the Lord's work, the promise is just as trustworthy now as the days of the apostles. Therefore, do not sit pretty and say, me, I don't have the gifts. Me, I don't know where to start. We are all gifted, okay? And we know where to start. Once you are done with your home, you are done with your neighbors, then you can go far. Okay? There's somebody who's stuffy right at your doorstep. The other point is what Ellen G. What I said that please let us not think that it's only the pastors who can do this. The pastors have, their, have got their work, but if you imagine that they can carry all this load on their own, then we are making a grievous, actually, what the term she's using is fatal mistake. Ordained ministers are busy people. We know them, our pastors in this church, pastors out there, they are just a handful compared to the number of churches or even separate schools that they support. There are certain districts, okay, even in our own field here, I want to believe, where one pastor has got up to 10 churches and all Sabbath schools to take care of. So you can imagine, by the time he makes a round, okay, to each of the churches, probably can just make four visits to a church or a Sabbath school in a year. That is a lot of work. And besides that, the pastors also have their work that they're supposed to be doing outside, and, uh, and, and that is a lot. In terms of reaching out, there is so much for them. Therefore, it's not about pastors. It's about you and me. Those ones who have been called, okay, by Jesus Christ to this work. And it's a privilege for us to participate. Another point I want to just put forth is that the church was established for this work. So our church, 15 Gong Avenue, a new life, was established for the purpose of reaching out and saving lives. This is a core mandate, our friends, of the church. Ellen G. White again writes in the Acts of the Apostles, she says that the church is God's agency for the salvation of men. Its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. And God's church is the court of holy life, filled with varied gifts and endowed with the Holy Spirit. The church, therefore, is the coordination center of this work. It's through the church that we can work and be effective in our evangelistic work. Yes, I know that there are people who can go out there having their own individual ministries. That's okay. But for us to be effective, then there has to be a coordination center. And the coordination center, friends, is the church. And therefore, things have to start from the, the church. In fact, one of the biggest mandates of our church board in any church is to spearhead evangelistic work. If there's a church board that is not focusing on evangelistic work, then that church board is not discharging their mandate effectively. And this is something that we have to take into consideration and take it very, very seriously. So, if the church, therefore, then is the coordinating center for a successful evangelistic work, then we must plan as a church. We must plan as a church. And that's where the strategic plan comes in. 
the strategic plan comes in at this particular point. And we know very well that without a plan, then we are planning to fail. Okay? It will be difficult for a church that doesn't plan to align their work to the course of Christ as spelled out in the uh, Great Commission. Without planning, suddenly there's going to be disorder. And this can, be, can potentially lead to chaos. And you know when there are chaos in church, or when there are chaos even in the evangelistic work that we do, it does not glorify God. But you know what? It does please the devil. It does please Satan. He's very excited when he sees chaos happening in the church and especially in, uh, in the evangelistic work that we do. But having said that, I know that we are not angels. That even when we plan uh, very well, uh, there are uh, situations whereby, again, suddenly we'll experience chaos happening. People bring their personal interest into God's work and so on. There's push and pull, okay, in this work. And that does not please God. And it's something that we need to put to prayer at individual level and also as a church so that uh, at the end of the day it's about God being glorified. It's not about you and me. It's about God and reaching out to some soul that is stuffing for bread of life out there. And those are many. So we know that the work cannot be completed without proper and adequate planning. And also implementation of the plan that is done in a transparent manner. And by transparent here, I mean openness. People have to be very, very clear on how they use God's resources as they do the evangelistic work. I know that again, as imperfect beings, this is an area that we need to watch out. It's an, an area that needs prayers, my friends. That we are able to discharge this work in a transparent manner, open manner, man, a manner that will glorify our God. It is important that we do that. But friend, in spite of all this, like I said earlier, God wants us to succeed. We are his children. And this commission, he has surely assured us that we will succeed because he says in the Great Commission, in verse 20, he says that, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The very end of the age. At no time is Christ going to leave us. Christ will walk with us when things are bad. Christ will walk with us when things are good. Okay? There's no way he's going to abandon us. He's with us. That's a promise. And because of that, Christ has promised that we, he will ensure that we succeed. We may have our shortfalls here and there, but at the end of the day, it is success. And talking about failure, there is a, a verse in Luke 14, verses in Luke 14, very, very common that we usually make reference to. Luke 14, verse 28 to 30. Uh, which again, as much the context is about the cost of following Jesus Christ, but we use it a lot in terms of our planning work, okay, as we, we prepare for work. And, and to me, it's, it's, it encourages us to, 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 to be able to, to, to understand, okay, this parable in uh, Luke 14, verse 28 to 30. It says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Would you first sit down and estimate the costs to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you. Saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Failure. Failure is bad, my friends. And God doesn't encourage failure. Okay? Failure ridicules you. God doesn't receive glory, glory, but the devil is happy. And therefore, even as we are called, and even as we participate 
in this co uh, work of the Great Commission, it's about success. And we know where success comes from. It's only through Jesus Christ. Okay? Those cares you hear that come during these evangelistic campaigns that we have, you know, that is the hand of the devil. And the devil doesn't want us to succeed. He wants us to fail. And therefore, friends, let us uphold Jesus Christ because he has promised us that we will succeed. We will not fail without, uh, with him. And having said that, and then I think it's important that we also uh, talk about our performance. I know this is work that was commissioned years back. We don't know when Jesus Christ is coming, but we know he's coming soon. But this work has to be done. How are we doing? As a church, globally, regionally, at the country level, at sub-regional level, how are we doing? We have to evaluate for us to be able to understand that. And that's why one of the big components in our strategic plan is about monitoring and evaluation. And through this, our friends, and then a church can take corrective measures. A church can take corrective measures uh, where we have gone wrong, then we can make corrections, and that's why monitoring and evaluation is important for us. We know there are several verses in the Bible that make reference to issues to do with assessment, and um, I don't have to go through all of them, but just, just pick a few of them. Like, for example, even at the very, very beginning, okay, as God was creating the world, remember, after every event, okay, Christ used to say that it was, it was good. That's an element of assessment. It's an element of evaluation. Okay? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 4, 10 and 12, 18, 21 and 25, he does mention, as he went through the week of creation, he does mention that it was good. But when he created man, he said what? He said it was very, very good. Very, very good. And that's why you and me, men created by God, we need to be happy because God loves us. Because when he created us, he didn't just say it was good, but he said it's very, very good. Okay? And, uh, and that's an element of assessment. And we know also, like later on, uh, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 11 to 12, you know, after a while, God did make an assessment and realized that, oh, he looked at the earth and he said, the people have become corrupt. They are filled with violence. He made an assessment. And when he made an assessment, he took some corrective action. So, it's important that we do evaluate what we do. And there are several other verses. I won't go into that. But probably just to touch on the one of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. You know, the seven churches. Alright? Where... For each of them, after having been assessed and evaluated by Christ, he gave a commendation and a recommendation for each of them to correct themselves. Okay? And therefore, God is in the business of not only assessing, but also correcting. Okay? Uh, as, as we implement. So, how is the church doing anyway? Uh, I'm sure evaluations are being conducted at different levels. Um, and probably one of the key performance indicators that uh, we may want to talk about in our church to measure, to gauge how we are performing, is probably just the number of new members that we bring to church. That's just a simple one, okay? An easy one to measure, the numbers that we bring to, to church. And we know that this is happening across board, globally, and so on. So if we can use that just to measure our performance, then we will have an indication of how we are doing. And remember, the only issue of evaluating ourselves is not to condemn us, but to appreciate and also take corrective action. Some statistics that we have here may not be too encouraging, but that is the reality, okay? Um, and I just want to give you just a few examples, okay, from the data available. And this data is available, by the way, in the sites, in our, our GC sites. 
uh, this one that is on archives and it has got statistics of uh, uh, people who have been baptized and so on, you know, across board. Now, take this one, for example. Between December 2020 and December 2021, a period of one year, the number of new members globally were 188,169 against 95,000 churches. Okay? Those are the churches we had in 2021. This means that on average, that each church managed to baptize two members. This is now global. Okay? And we know that there are variations across regions. Okay? There are variations, but globally, each church, we have got 95,000 of them, each church on average managed to baptize two members, bring new members, two of them, in one year. That's a global picture. Like I said, I know that there are regional variations. Okay? Let's just come home. In our two unions, um, the average per church, you know, we've got East Kenya Union Conference and West Kenya Union Conference all combined. So we're just looking at the data. The data is also available in 2021. When you work out the math, you realize that the average per church is about nine baptisms per church that happened in 2021. You know, there are several churches also in our, in our unions. Um, but again, there are variations within church. Like, for example, New Life, we baptized very many, okay? Nine is a small number because we are a big church. But there are churches out there that probably are not even managing to baptize one person in a year. And that's why the average is playing around two at global level, nine at our regional level, okay? And uh, I just want to leave it to you to make judgment. It's up to you to make judgment, all right? How are we doing? So, friends, in the, uh, really, in the, what are some of the issues that are affecting how we perform? What are some of the issues that are affecting how we perform? As I get into conclusion, I want us to look again at our key text. Um, in NIV, it reads, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. That's our text for the day. It reads, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I want to repeat. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. The title of my sermon this morning, like I said, is Are You Worthy? Are you living a life worthy of the calling? Are you living a life worthy of the calling? And that becomes a big question for us today. Even as we continue to conclude, and there are many questions. What is what is what is your calling as a Christian? You who's out there uh, watching us virtually, you who's in church, do you know what your calling is? Big questions we have, isn't it, to answer. What does it mean then to live a life worthy of our calling? What does it mean? I know that these are difficult questions for us to answer. But the Bible does have answers. In the Bible, the word call is used most often to refer to God's initiative to bring people to Christ. And to participate in his redemptive work in the world. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 4 says that God desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge 
of the truth. God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to be saved. And that's the work we have to do. And that's our calling. So friends, living a life worthy of the calling is about actively participating in the Great Commission. Reaching out and bringing people to Jesus Christ. Is that what you and me are doing? Can you qualify as persons living a life worthy their calling? You and me, can you qualify? If we do qualify, then why are we performing in such a dismal manner? Why are churches globally baptizing only two people per year? Why are the unions, our two unions, the closest to us where we belong? Doing nine on average per church. I'm talking about averages, not absolute numbers. And for me and you, it's a question that needs answers. It's a question that needs answers because then we have to get out of this mess, out of this dismal performance that we find ourselves in. We need to get out, friends. There must be factors that are affecting us to be in this situation. And when Paul asks the Ephesians and urging them to live a life worthy of their calling, he goes ahead to tell them what it takes, what is expected of them to be able to live a life worthy of their calling. And I want us just to look at a few points as I close. The first one, for us to note, that we have to be completely humble and gentle. It says completely humble and, and gentle. A worthy walk before God will be marked by humility and gentleness. Humility that is driven by a deep realization of how much God loves us. And because of this realization, we are bent on serving God. You know, if you don't believe that God loves you, then how can you love someone else? But if you know deeply and you realize that God loves you, then something is going to drive you to look at another person and actually say, yes, this is God's creature and therefore love them. And that's the beginning of us becoming better Christians. When you love your brother, then you are going to serve them. When you love your sister, then you are going to make every effort to serve them. But if you are not humble, you are not gentle, then you will not look unto them. When you are humble, if you are called to serve, instead of complaining, you smile. Because of what God has done to you and me. Yes, when you are asked to make a visitation to a needy family, a needy member, you will go. You will not complain. You will not start asking where do they live or whatever. You will serve them. And yes, when you are humble, driven by humility, when you are asked to make financial contributions to some needy member, to the church, you will give. Why? Because there's a deep realization in you that God loves you. 
And because God loves you, then you are going to love someone else. You are going to do something to support someone else. Oh yes, when you are humble, you will pay your tithes and offerings freely and joyously. And by paying your tithes and offering freely and joyously, then this gospel is going to spread, my friends. This gospel is going to go forward, my friends. Number two. You, need, you and me need to be patient, bearing with one another in love. We need these friends so that the inevitable wrongs that occur between people in God's family will not affect his work or his purpose. I know we are, we are, we are human, yes? We, we wrong each other and so on. But that, once we make those wrongs, it should not interfere with God's work. And we are called upon to be patient and to bear with one another. We do make mistakes. Someone defined uh, patience as the spirit that has the power to take revenge, but never does. It's a characteristic of a forgiving, generous heart. Yes, friends, with patience, even if someone wrongs you, you will say, this is God's child, just as me. You just say, Lord, have mercy. And yes, you will work towards reconciling before sunset. Can we be patient? Can we bear with one another? We make mistakes. Oh yes, we do. We wrong each other. Oh yes, we do. We scratch one another. Oh yes, we do. But let us be patient with one another. Let's forgive each other. Just like Christ forgives us. Number three. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Unity of the spirit results from being humble and patient. That's having a forgiving attitude towards each other. It comes naturally. You do not create it. It just comes. God has already created and given it to you. Please know that this is a spiritual unity we are talking about here. Not necessarily a structural or kind of denominational unity. It knows no ethnicity. The unity we are talking about here. The spiritual unity. It knows no ethnicity. It doesn't know any tribe. It knows no racism. It doesn't know class, economic, social, or whatever. It doesn't. It doesn't know nationality, that you are Kenyan, you are Ugandan, you are what? It doesn't. It doesn't know language. Kisi, Luo, Luya, Kikuyu, Kamba, Somali, it doesn't know. This is the spiritual unity we are talking about. And therefore, we should make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. I know we do have ethnic groupings even in our churches. And I know those groupings probably are meant to unite, but they're just uniting people along tribal lines, ethnic lines. But even within the groups, you fight. 
That is the sadness. So what unity are we talking about? I urge you to invite spiritual unity into those groups that you belong to. When you stop fighting, you will now focus on God's work. I want to believe that those groups that we have formed, they are there to help us spread the gospel as the first priority. Friend, as I, I conclude, there are three things I just want you to remember. I'm not going to delve much into them, just to remember. The first one, remember, there is only one body and one spirit. There is only one body and one spirit. There is only one church and one spirit. Friends, I also want to remember, these are things that you know, but I better make you remember. Remember, there is only one God and Father of all. Each and every one of us, it's just one Father. For all of us. And you know, at times we forget and think that there are different gods for different people. There's a God of those people who live in the informal settlements. And there's a God for those people who live elsewhere. No. Just remember, there's only one God and Father of all. If you remember that way, then you are going to wake up and you are going to walk. Walk a life worthy of your calling. And lastly, just for us to remember. You and me have been equipped. You cannot sit pretty and say that you don't know. You have not empowered. You are empowered. Because Christ has already done it. Remember, the time you take vows here for baptism, Christ recruits you into his work. And he empowers you. Because God wants you to be a participant. God wants you to be involved. Wants, wants you to reach out to a person. That way we are going to spread this. And we are going to improve on the way we work. So good people, as I finish. If we possess these traits or characteristics. Then we will live a life of our calling. And the benefits will be realized in increased church activities directed at implementing the Great Commission as detailed in the church strategic plan. Let's do things. As highlighted, as directed in the strategic plan. Because it's the strategic plan that gives us a strategic direction that we are, as a church, following in a five-year period. After that, it can be refreshed. After that, probably a new one can come. But then, let's keep to that. So, as I finish, let me ask this. How many join me to say that we strive and by the guidance of the Holy Spirit we live a life worthy of their calling. If you do, wherever you are, stand up and we pray. If you do, and honestly so, stand up and we pray. Let us pray. Our dear and loving Master and our God who is in heaven, Father, we want to thank you for your word that's encouraging us, first of all, to be organized by planning. Secondly, our word which is urging us to uphold 
certain traits for us to be able to walk a life worthy of our calling. Lord, your children have stood up because they want to walk a life worthy of the calling. And the calling is the work of the Great Commission. I want to commit them into your hands this moment that, dear Father, may you touch each and every one of them now. May you reawaken in their lives that life that they desire. May you give them the energy, give them the strength that, Lord, they will be able to start taking steps to support your work in a better way, in a better manner, henceforth. We ask this, Lord, believing that you will do is a humble prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you and may God bless you.